Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the How to Film Weddings podcast. My name is John Bunn and I am riding solo today. Well, I have a guest, but it's just me. And if you were wondering, me and Nick are still friends. There's been a, it's been a long time since Nick and myself have been together on an episode, but really, uh, it just comes down to the fact that both of us have very full wedding filmmaking schedules this year. I have traveled over 10,000 miles in the last month for my weddings. Nick is on pace to do the same. Um, as of today, I'm back home. Um, I'm about to be out of town again. And uh, Nick and I have been splitting up and just recording different things so that we can get ahead and have enough content and have it ready for you. So Nick and I are still best good buddies. We will be back together soon. My crazy wedding schedule has calmed way down, thank God. And I'm now able to get right back into some more of the How to Film Weddings content. So there's a lot more coming up um, for you all. I wanted to say this. I'm really excited about today's episode. Um, I'm good friends with Christy and Kaylin over at White and Reverie. They were on our podcast a few weeks ago um, and uh, a big fan of uh, Gamut.io and all the color grading tools that they have. Um, And saw the other day, a couple months back, they shared a new LUT that came out with Russell Kent Nichols out of the UK. And I was like, who the heck is this guy? I clicked over to his Instagram and immediately fell in love. Um, And honestly, was like, I have to get this guy on the podcast. He is na- he's been named one of the UK's top 30 wedding filmmakers. He's based in Southeast England and his films are ridiculously cool. He has grown a pretty large Instagram following just with showing up, being in front of the camera a lot. He's done a really good job of not just following trends. His edits are ridiculous and his color is ridiculous. And we have a really great conversation about all of it. So without further ado, let's hop into this week's episode of the How to Film Weddings podcast with Russell Kent Nichols. All right. Well, Russell, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the How to Film Weddings podcast. You are here and I would love for you to introduce yourself to the How to Film Weddings audience. Who are you? Where are you located? Tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, hi John. I am Russell, or Russell Kent Nichols is my full name, Kent being my middle name. Um, I'm based down, ironically, in Kent, which is in southeast of England, mainly doing weddings, but also doing the odd commercial project as well. I've done a few music videos in the last year, um, which I really enjoy. But yeah, mostly buckling down into 2022 wedding season, which has been pretty full on. So yeah, just surviving, getting through it enjoying it as much as ever yeah and i found you um i'm good friends with the guys over at gamut and kaylin rome and uh yeah. over at white and reverie and saw their them posting about you and some new luts that you have and so and i was like who is this guy where'd he come from uh so i started following you and watching some of your work and it's incredible um and the colors are super beautiful and the work is like next level you can tell you use really nice equipment. You're really good at what you do. So um, I would love to kind of know a little of the backstory of how you got to where you're at today. Like, how'd you get into cameras? What uh, what drew you to it? How long you been doing it? Just like, what's that story? Yeah, so it's quite an interesting story, actually. I think I first got into cameras growing up um, in, back in the VHS days. My parents' friends came over, they had a big VHS camera and it wasn't until I was kind of in my teenage teenage years where I saw the, the, the VHS footage of me and my dad. And I thought, wow, like having a camera, the stuff that you shoot now or back then isn't really for that time. It's kind of for the future. Um, so uh, yeah, my, I was always asking for like gadgets and cameras for birthday presents and Christmas presents and just started at school making like silly videos with my friends. Um, And then weddings really kind of, I guess like a a lot of wedding videographers now, you kind of start off shooting for friends and family members. um, And then you kind of get that that bug. And yeah, people asking me to shoot their weddings, uh, starting off really cheap just to kind of get into the flow of it, get the feel of if you like it or not. Um, So yeah, kind kind of similar in that respect to a lot of other filmmakers starting out, gradually increasing prices, taking on more and more. Um, But I guess what is kind of different for me is that for the last 14 years, I've actually been doing 
I'm running another business, like an e-commerce business, and I've been doing weddings properly uh, for about four years now. Um, it got to the point, actually, only seven months ago, where I thought that other business, which was a um, health supplement manufacturing e-commerce business, which is still running, I'm just not there anymore. Um, I decided, you know, 2022 is my year. I need to do what I love. Like I'm in my mid mid thirties now, and I thought if I don't if I don't make that break and switch over to being in in control of my own destiny, I guess it's kind of now or never. Um, so the the other business was run by myself and my business partner. I did a lot of the e commerce roles within that business. He was more of kind of like financial side of things. So anything creative like brochures, product design, uh, email marketing. Um, all of the ad, ad campaigns I would do as well. Um, and yeah, I just decided December just gone that I couldn't do both um, and jumped full time into, into video. So I would say I've actually been doing video full time for the last three years, but it's just, I've been doing two full time things. So I thought, right, it's now or never. And yeah, made, made that jump in, in December just gone. Yeah, I love it. And so you said you're southeast uh, of London, correct? Yeah, uh, so like 60, 60 miles from London. I can get to London in, in an hour. Okay, cool. Um, and so um, you start doing some work for some friends. You start doing like, um, you said you're, you're, a, you're a gearhead, a tech guy. You really yeah. appreciate that sort of thing. Um, so you start yeah, doing yeah. these things. What was what what, what those first weddings look like? What did you shoot those on? Um, like what, oh, what was your, what was your skill level to get to do these? Like, I mean, what, how, how did those first few weddings go? Yeah. I mean, I guess they were kind of basic. I, <laughs> I was using, um, do you remember the, you know, the Inspire, the DJI Inspire, the, the big drone that they brought out, mm -hmm. um, you could actually take the camera off of that and put it onto a handheld Osmo thing. Yep, I um, remember. and I had, I had the pro version of the Inspire and it said this camera I was putting onto this little battery powered stick and using my my phone as a screen I felt like a boss with that thing because I was like yeah this is this is the Osmo Pro um and just shooting everything in like the wrong settings and yeah just saving it to the little SD card and it was kind of basic just highlights reels that kind of thing it wasn't really shooting any audio um, mm -hmm. or speeches or anything it was kind of just like three minute highlights um then i remember seeing an advert for the gh5 come out and i remember watching i still remember watching this clip of this woman in the desert and i thought that camera looks amazing and then having been a huge fan of white and reverie stuff watching their their video shot on it i felt right i need this gh5 and that's kind of what got me into the panasonic stuff um Moving then, still kind of doing highlight stuff on a, like a Sigma 18 to 35, which was like a great all rounder, uh, fast zoom. Um, moving on to the S series, the full frame stuff, which really like was a big step up from the Micro Four Thirds. Um, and yeah, and I still still have all of those S series cameras now with the arrival of the Ronin 4D, which I kind of had like a love hate relationship with because. It, when it came out, I was thinking it was going to be this all-in-one system that is going to save me so much time. It's going to be really practical to kind of have all day and just swapping stuff out with, with one battery. Hated it at first, really hated it. Um, really had bad buyer's remorse. I think <laughs> all of the things, I, I think as we get to know our kit, like I was using a, a Shinobi external monitor and the RS2 gimbal and Obviously, I'd chosen the camera to go on on that gimbal. All of those things you can kind of tweak to your liking, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the Ronin 4D, it I don't know. There's just felt like there's a lot of features missing. It's really it's really heavy. That is something that I really struggle with. And the color science is not as good as Lumix. And but I guess with any kind of new equipment, you have to kind of persevere with it. And uh, yeah, now I'm loving. So I've gone. I'm loving it. I've gone kind of from DJI to Panasonic, back to DJI again, but still using the the Panasonic cameras as well. But yeah. Yeah. I just, I love technology so much. I could just yeah. read, read reviews and watch YouTube videos of it all day. I'm, I'm never, never satisfied. I always think, right, I'm going to switch to cine lenses, but 
which ones and then I'll try different ones and review them and yeah it just it I get bored really quickly mm -hmm. so I'm surprised I've stuck to weddings for this long really it's just kind of very short attention span with that kind of stuff yeah I, lo I love hearing that I love uh hearing people's stories on on how they've gotten to where they're at and it's you know, I've just recently switched from Canon to Sony and have been mm -hmm. messing with those and starting to really like the Sony cameras and the these different lenses and really have gotten into a lot of color grading over the last, you know, six, eight months. I've done a few mentor sessions myself with other filmmakers saying, like, teach me more about this. I want to understand the color science. I want to understand the details. Um, and I want to get into that here in a little bit with you because um, I know that you, you know, color is really important to you, um, those sort of things, and that your footage is so good um, watching your films. And I know that that is a great way to make you stand out and get more bookings and get more mm -hmm. um, eyeballs um, on your brand. I know your Instagram has, has blown up a lot in the, in the last bit. Um, I would love to kind of hear a little of the story. You did a few weddings um, you know, like with some DJI stuff, you switched over. Um, when did you feel like you started to build momentum with your brand? I think, um, probably 2020, like lockdown was actually a point where I thought, you know what, forget all of the, the bookings that have been postponed. Now is a time where maybe a lot of my competition aren't really doing a great deal because they're either scared or they they're not sure how to be creative or they're not sure what to do now to kind of bring the money in and I think that's kind of where I kind of looked at alternative sources of income so that's where the lots came in and also just being able to create more I guess like styled shoots to really really hone in on what my ideal client is so I feel like like what you were saying with with Hunter um you always post more of what you want and that that gave me the opportunity to be creative over that kind of year um and then that was with, like doing the workshops and stuff like that and yeah just being able to spend that time being creative and try new things and try new styles that maybe a couple you know your, your normal couples wouldn't necessarily appreciate or it might not be their vibe um so yeah i think 2020 was really the time when my on i had a lot more time to spend kind of online engaging my audience trying new things also, I feel like the world could have done with a lot of entertainment at that point. And I was trying to use my sense of humor to connect with people as well. So I, even though I take my job super seriously, I don't, I don't, um, yeah, I always like to have a bit of fun. There's always a fun element to stuff as well with the way that I work. So I'm not, I'm not shy of making fun of myself or looking stupid. Um, so yeah, 2020 was really a great opportunity for me to be able to put myself out there um, and just connect with a lot of people and just start with some more educational stuff, the LUTs, and just, yeah, make the most of, of that downtime. However, that said, I was still working full time in my other business as well. So even though I didn't have any weddings, I wasn't just at home all the time. Um, but yeah, it gave me more time kind of evenings and weekends to be able to, to expand that creativity. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of just like, uh, getting out of your shell and stuff, like I know that you've had a lot of, uh, you know, you said being funny or stuff. I'm thinking about some of your Instagram reels that one I saw where it was like getting ready on the wedding day, you're in a robe and then like you jump and like your drones flying in your house. And like, uh, yeah. I know that, that one was older. Um, but like, yeah. you know, some of those things, uh, what, what role has Instagram played in your, in your success? Oh, it has been like I, I have a love-hate relationship with it but ultimately it has been amazing like at school I was always quite a shy not shy but if I was ever on stage or reading a book I always remember reading a book in English class and it, you used to read like a, a portion of the book and I'd be so anxious that my turn was coming up that I wouldn't yes. be able to to speak and yeah stage fright has always been a big thing for me even though in smaller groups of people I've been you know, I'm, I can, I've got no problem at all. Um, so yeah, being able to be able to show my personality um, and just really connect with people and be myself has done the world of good for my confidence. There are things that I do now that I wouldn't have been able to do a couple of years ago, but I think having that feedback and realizing that it's okay to just be yourself 
Um, I think with business, a lot of people think, oh, you have to take things so seriously. But these days, things are so different, like with behind the scenes and getting to know the individual rather than the brand. Um, so, yeah, I feel Instagram has has been the biggest um, catalyst for giving me that confidence and the kind of feedback that that I get from that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not very good at taking compliments. So when people say, oh, this is amazing, I'm like, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's it's that has been it's got such a great community. Like here in the UK, photographers and videographers, we are like not worried about sharing experiences and tips and being truthful and just yeah, just stories um and posts and reels and just being being yourself and yeah, you don't yeah, just be yourself and that's not only will your peers see that and appreciate that, but your couples can then get to know you as a person as well yeah it's like i loved looking through in preparation for this episode just seeing the kinds of things that you tried out education for couples i know some of the videos that went like bigger for have gone bigger for you you know it's like eight ways to make your wedding video better or you know like tips for couples or um what would what advice would you have to somebody that's out there that says i want to do what russell's doing with my instagram i want to get out there um, where would you start? Like where, what advice would you have with somebody that does want to do more on Instagram? Um, mm -hmm. how can somebody find success with their Instagram? I think the biggest thing is, is stories, um, and talking to camera. I meet a lot of photographers that are maybe a bit older than me at weddings and they're like, ah, Instagram, you know, it's a waste of time. Nobody wants to hear me talking. And I said to them, like, you'd be surprised who's watching. And even though you might be talking about really mundane things or, or your, your kit there are always people that are going to be interested and people that are um in your industry that are not as experienced as you that will pick up on things and and appreciate that and share so i think instagram stories talking to camera is 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 one way of connecting like immediately with your audience so i know a lot of people are quite like i used to have like stage fright about that um if that is your thing if like if you're nervous about talking to camera then just record it and save it and then do as many takes as you need. Like that's what I would do. Just do do multiple snippets and then post them, always using captions. I think with Instagram as well, like with stories, you've got the GIFs, um, the music feature, the filters, the captions, everything. So the more tools that you use that Instagram provide for you, um, the better algorithmically things are. I noticed with Reels as well, <clears throat> that if I use um, a trending song or a filter that is trending and put titles on using the Instagram app that it tends to perform better rather than if I just write them on a final cut. Um, so I feel like they, they definitely pick up on those and give you rewards based on using those features. And uh, yeah, I think it's just the biggest tip would be just do more Instagram stories. I remember one day I did like 60, 60 stories um, I always joke as well, like uh, one of my favorite hobbies is after a busy day, sit back in bed and just watch back my own stories. What a masterpiece. But yeah, no, I just, I really love, I could story everything all day. Um, but yeah, definitely. That's, that's something to, to concentrate on. Definitely. Yeah. I like, I like that advice for sure. And I think that a lot of people don't, uh, you, you know, they'll say things about Instagram or about like putting themselves in front of a camera. I've had a lot of conversations with mentor sessions and stuff lately that you are your brand. You know, it's like people want to see you and connect with you. And if they see you on your stories and they see what you're doing and what's important to you, you're going to attract people that are attracted to things that you care about. So your your clients become more the kinds of clients you want and uh, you're able to book, you know, book more people that see you for you and there's something magical about doing that and getting to work with people that like want you the specific person and I'm the same way. Like um, you know, I always hid behind my brand name. I I just changed my my main video company to John Bunn Films. Um, and I just thought nobody wants to see me. And as soon as I made those changes and started like really showing up, people started messaging me and being like, Oh, I relate to you because you're a dad or I relate to you because you like to watch, you know, this show or you like, you know, you're a big fan of Taylor Swift or whatever it is like about me. Um, and then really infusing that into everything that I'm, I'm doing in my brand. Um, I've got a lot more I want to talk to you about and we're going to do it right after this break. 
Nick and I have to tell you about one of our favorite places to upload our wedding films, and that is Love Stories TV. Love Stories TV is one of the best free resources for us wedding filmmakers. The best part is they are bringing the couples to us. All we have to do is upload our films and we are good to go. Upload unlimited wedding films to your completely free business page. Setup is easy and your films can be live in just minutes. Now is the perfect time to start uploading to Love Stories TV. So head on over to howtofilmweddings.com slash lovestoriestv to check out all of the details and see how Love Stories TV is giving away $10,000 in cash to wedding filmmakers just like you. That's howtofilmweddings.com slash lovestoriestv to start uploading and connecting with the right couples today. One question that we see wedding filmmakers asking, what is the best site for licensing music? We have one answer, Musicbed. I have been exclusively using Musicbed since 2016 and our films are better because of it. I have been told during consultations that couples love our films because they feel raw, authentic, and that the music wasn't cheesy. Musicbed has a roster of incredibly talented musicians, bands, and composers who pour their hearts into their work and you can hear the difference. Find the perfect song with Musicbed's intuitive search features like genre, mood, beats per minute, and key, which is probably my favorite of the search perimeters. Head over to howtofilmweddings.com slash musicbed to do what I did and take your wedding films to the next level. Use promo code HTFW22 at checkout to receive one month free with the purchase of any annual subscription. That's howtofilmweddings.com slash musicbed. All right, we're back from break, and I'm here with Russell Kent Nichols out of the UK, my good buddy here. And we're we were just talking right before the break, just about infusing your personality into your brand. You've done that really well. Uh, what advice do you have for somebody when it comes to this topic? Yeah, I think just what uh, I'll give you an example. What I love when I rock up at a wedding, and one of the bridesmaids who's maybe seen my stuff on Instagram for a little while, maybe after the bride has booked me. Um, and I really love pizza. It's just, for me, pizza is a way of life, so much so that I have a new tattoo of, of a pizza slice on my ribs. And um, now, yeah, like rocking up at a wedding and people are like, ah, oh, Russell, we've, we've got you a pizza. And I think, you know what? That is the kind of client that I want. The client for me, that is not that they're obsessed with me or anything, that is great, obviously, but to know that we're kind of on the same page, that they understand what I like and I, I know what they like um, and just have somebody that appreciates you for being there. I feel like that is going to give you the, the best customer relationship and the best end result um, as well. And yeah, the, the other day I had an inquiry saying um, for a wedding and at the bottom there was a, a sentence that just said, oh, and there will be pizza with a winky face. So obviously I had to say yes. But yeah, I think just just showing behind the scenes of your life. Um, it's kind of a, it's a weird thing, isn't it? Because before you wouldn't dream of messaging a client. It would always be like quite formal through emails and stuff like that. And now there's kind of no hiding that side of stuff, but it, it has its benefits. I, I love that, that I can see from the point of booking, trying to, to get to know my couples and see, the family updates and stuff on Instagram and just, um, yeah, I feel like it's a great icebreaker as well. So you're not rocking up and not knowing who your couple are. You kind of know who their members of their family are, what their hobbies are. And I feel like that can help you even in ways that was like picking music for the couple as well, just knowing the kind of vibe um, and their energy. So yeah, I think just that whole customer relationship thing um, through Instagram is, is really, really amazing. Yeah. And again, I, I think we earlier is either earlier today or yesterday, one of the mentor sessions that we were doing, um, you know, it does feel like a, it can feel awkward to be like, well, I don't want to put myself out there or I don't want to be fake and only show like this best part of my life. I don't want to just only, but like more and more how you said, like with Instagram, it's blurring the lines between like personal life, professional life. And obviously you have to set up what boundaries you're going to have on what you're going to share. But the more that I'm having someone film me when I'm at a wedding or having somebody film me and incorporating that. And in, I posted a reel yesterday on my uh, wedding video page. And like, it was when I was in Guatemala 
um, I showed like eight clips from Guatemala, but one of them is a clip of me working with the couple mixed in there and that like just showing myself and like getting myself out there. And the more that I've put myself out there, the more that people want to book me and they want to pay me way more money because they see that, that I'm traveling to that place or I'm doing that thing. Um, advice for people that may be a little shy or maybe don't want to put themselves out there. Like what are some ways that you found that you can put yourself out there that feels genuine and authentic to you. Um, but also, um, you know, doesn't cross too many lines, that sort of thing. Um, what, what advice would you have to somebody on the importance of getting yourself out there? What has it done for you? Yeah. So, I mean, I completely relate to people that maybe are nervous about doing that or I feel like, or, oh, you know, I can see people doing this, but I don't know if it's for me. We've had like an epidemic of photographers making themselves look stupid on on reels like pointing at text boxes and things for, i don't know if you've had that as well but over here it's been i have not done really, it yeah yeah but yes it's yeah, annoying it's yeah annoying. yeah so, to me. and i think you know so definitely there's going to be people that are going to be looking at those thinking that is not for me um so you don't have to make yourself stupid one tip that i would, would say is next time you work with a photographer that you that you vibe with or that you work with regularly maybe just ask them if they can take a picture of you with your kit or take a behind the scenes photo of you start with the photo that way it's going to give you the opportunity to to craft a caption uh, and just introduce yourself um i probably introduce myself more often than most people just because again for me the the personal side of the branding is really important um but yeah just start off start off with the photo and then if you can have anybody use their phone to, or your phone to capture you behind the scenes working that will ease you into showing who you are and uh yeah i feel like if you are self-conscious about your appearance or how you speak just take take the time to record like um a few takes and then save those and then post them as and when you feel comfortable i think just jumping in and just doing it will and you realize nothing bad happens is um and the feedback is going to be a lot better than you look a lot more positive than you anticipate it is it's quite a, a nerve-wracking thing if you're not used to being in front of the camera uh, but i promise you it's not as bad as yeah you no i think that and that's similar with like how to film weddings and putting ourselves out there with uh you know just being in front of the camera all the time now like i'm in front of a camera more than i'm not in front of a camera and it's like you know, I look back to episode number one of our podcast recording and we're, you know, over 200 episodes in now, just like, I'm so much more comfortable now. Like just, I got more comfortable the more that I practiced. Um, it just takes so, practice, doesn't it? Yeah. And showing, you know, just showing or getting in front of the camera. And, um, I, I was thinking about when you were talking, you know, just about, um, when I started filming weddings, 2007, um, was my first wedding. Uh, Instagram didn't exist. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that's changed. And I remember the only way to get in front of couples was either Google ads, which was really new or SEO. going, yeah, SEO, going to wedding, wedding shows, fest. bridal shows. Yeah. Yeah. And so you would save up your money. You pay two or $3,000 to get a booth. You'd have to buy like metal trusts and like flat screens and get banners and like try to like market to people and get them to trust you on a wedding video as they're like just walking by with a piece of cake in their hand. Like, what do you do? And it's like, oh my God. And like, and that was marketing in 2007. That's, like, that's, that's what we hard. had to do. I've done, and, I've yeah. done that and it, it just it didn't feel, I, I've done that and they didn't feel that they were the right couples because I feel like you can put as much stuff in front of people that you want, but the best way is for people to find you and make an educated decision that you are the right person for them. So I feel like, yes. yeah, that kind of hard sell at wedding fairs is, is yeah, I find and those quite, un quite uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. And you only way you could book people is if you were doing a special promotion or saving them money or, and now you, you know, you fast forward to the middle of 2022 and you have this magical world of the internet that makes it to where you can show up and edit and curate in a way, you know, and, and be in front of people. They can get to know you. Your website can help you, you know, people get to know you, the, the reels, the TikTok, all the things. Um, 
And the more that you can get comfortable and get these reps in and practice these things, big things mm -hmm. can happen. You can create LUT packs that go on sale at Gamut. You can be named one of the top 30 wedding videographers in your country. Like you can do big things <laughs> just so you know, like Russell has done. And um, I want to talk to you. I, I would hate to have this episode and not to talk to you about like how you are getting the most like the edits that you're putting together the shooting um you, you said you're a gearhead and and things like that but um i know people when they see your work um your engagement's huge on your instagram page your films are ridiculously cool um I want to just kind of get into a little bit of a conversation about how you're putting together um, some of these edits and then specifically talking through some of the color stuff that you're doing. So um, how yeah. did you, like, where did you gain these skills? Is this like, what what's it going through your mind when it comes to, um, you know, the shooting, the editing, um, that sort of thing? I know that's a big question, but like, yeah, where, is, where did this all come so, from? Isn't it so hard to describe though? Like, that side of things i think when i'm editing i think if, you, if you're editing a piece and you especially if you think back to when you were shooting it you already know really the bits that are gonna make the final cut as they're happening um so like as i'm looking at my monitor when i'm shooting i'm thinking right that is a perfect bit so i think that makes it a lot easier when you're when you're kind of culling your ins and outs when you're reviewing your footage i think for me it's so hard to to know how to like even describe your own style because you kind of you make it so you can't really see it from like an outsider's perspective can you um i really really enjoy like a build and high energy um so yeah like i, I use a lot of lyrical pop from music bed that's kind of my favorite genre um i always try and have like a bit of scenery like with the venue and i don't know i guess I kind of just mix things together until they feel right. A lot of the time, I'm always using lyrical. 99% of the time, I'm using lyrical pop. So there may be words in that track where I'm talking about hands and I'll match the footage with the hands or something like that just to, yeah, just to make it a bit more of a an experience, I guess, and just to have a bit of energy and fun. I'm all about the fun. Like, I, I really just... I want to watch fun things. I want to create fun things. I want my couples to have fun and yeah, just be, just have everything as like an enjoyable experience and for the couples to watch back and go, yeah, do you know what? That was, was really good fun. There was, there was a quote, I can't remember who, who it's by, but the, um, the quote is something like they won't remember what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And I've always kind of stuck by that as my mantra like if I can make sure that people are having a really really good time and that I give them a hundred percent of everything on the wedding day that I know that whatever I put together they're gonna enjoy that and appreciate that um I think as well in the last couple of years where we're all kind of as creatives we're, we're making up for a loss of a couple of years experience I feel like a lot of people and where we've been creating um, our own projects, like the styled stuff, I feel like a lot of the content that we're making now is for other creatives in our industry rather than our couples. Uh, so there's, you have to remember when you're putting these things together as well, there's going to be moments in there that maybe you might normally cut because it's not as visually interesting or it doesn't have like a hard hitting heartfelt moment, but when I'm about to press delete on my keyboard to remove a clip, I just think if that, if this was my wedding, would that clip be really important for me to keep in? So maybe it's like friends and family or something that maybe isn't the most interesting shot. Um, but you know that they're going to appreciate, appreciate that. But yeah, I think for me, most people just see the kind of teasers that I make. That's really what I put on my Instagram and YouTube. And I just want to make sure that they are just energetic, cool, um and that they show people being themselves as well yeah i i know that that's kind of an impossible question like how do you edit or how do you you know what what is creativity to you or whatever but like as i was watching you know some of your work it is very high energy um the posing is super cool the way that you and it's mixed in so well with I remember seeing a video that was like you hiding in the bushes and it's like looking for a discreet wedding videographer, go find somebody else. And then it like cuts to you yeah. being, uh, you know, directing and doing some things. And it's just like, 
you are attracting a certain kind of person and you're uh, you know repelling a certain kind of person all at the same time which is good which is what yeah. you want and and you're you know you are saying I'm editing together some some longer things and like but your Instagram feed the way that that's flowing the way your branding is how your website is is the things that's going to attract people to want to really reach yeah. out to you and like um finding that style um my question I guess would be like um how did you like how long did it take you if someone's out there and they're like man I'm still trying to figure out who I am or what I am as a brand or how to what advice would you have to somebody that's like trying to figure out what their style would be yeah I, I guess like feel free to take inspiration from people but copying is definitely a no-no and but I, I guess you don't really know until you put something together and you, you play that back and you think oh yeah, that I can. You can feel that. Like, if you feel, I think any, everybody in this industry sh- is or should be an emotionally a person in touch with their emotions. If you can feel something when you when you play that back from the beginning, then that is the right. You've done a good job. So yeah, I feel like if I if I play something back right from the beginning and just take it all in, because um, as when we're editing, that is basically what we do. Watch things from the beginning like a hundred times uh, for the build and everything like that. Uh, but yeah, if you, if you can feel something, then you've done the right thing. And it, it does, it takes years to, to find your style. I don't even know, I don't really know what, what my style is apart from the fun elements. And I always want to keep that that going. I think like finding your ideal client as well is, is really important. I. I think I assumed maybe a couple of years ago that all I wanted was was luxury, really ex- really big budget weddings. Actually, it's not really what what I want because I feel like you maybe won't have that connection if the couple are kind of hidden behind a planner. Um, so I feel like if you you have to kind of find a, a comfortable middle ground of a couple that's relatable that has good taste as well and has got some really cool things to shoot visually but i think ultimately the best thing is the connection with the couple there um so yeah just just have fun with it just have fun this is this is this can be a really fun and enjoyable industry to work in it can be really hard work but it is so rewarding when you know that you've made something for people that they're going to be watching back in like 20 years time yeah, I, lo- I love all that. I think that's really important. And as I've, you know, watched and studied your brand and like I always take inspiration from people, I'm motivated just like, um, you know, just by seeing what you're doing and leaning into who, who you are and what makes you different. Um, I want to kind of finish up our chat today just talking a little bit about color um, and color for films. Um, your, your color is is beautiful and stunning. Uh, you did, Thank you know, you. we've, we've mentioned that you're, you're very into gear. Um, some people are very intimidated by gear. Um, oh, they're intimidated, it. uh, intimidated by, um, you know, I just switched to the Sony's and, yeah. um, I, I won't, wish, I won't rip you. I won't rip you for it. I'm, thank I'm you. not, I'm not pro Sony. I'll be completely honest. Um, but I know they have made some good improvements in the last. Yes, few I've been years. Canon for the... forever. I'm on the Sony FX3s and the A7S3s. Nice. Um, nice. But with that came 10-bit footage, and yeah, it also finally. came. Yeah, <laughs> and it came with it. Man, I'm feeling some. I'm so I'm feeling like a little ashamed <laughs> over here. But this is why uh, people well, I mean, are intimidated. Lumix <laughs> had, yeah, I mean, Lumix has had 10-bit for like. Yes, typical Ten Panasonic. Years, yeah, we get it. Panasonic's yeah. awesome. Um, yeah. We get it. Yeah, but you just switch from Panasonic, so whatever. You you, you tell me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But, I'll keep quiet. <laughs> uh, when it came to color, I always felt like I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I don't mm-hmm. know how to get it right in camera. I don't know how to like. You know, I was shooting on the C100 Mark IIs for a long time. It was eight bit, mm-hmm. like the color. I just couldn't push the colors. Now I'm in a world where I'm shooting log. <laughs> And, um, you know, just having learned all about that and got my new MacBook, got my new faster, you know, like I can edit this stuff finally. You've got everything you need. Really started to dig in and started to practice a lot. And I'm starting to geek out on how much fun it is to like really get in there with scopes and like really. um, And so like for somebody that's intimidated about color um, specifically, Um, I know mm. that you have LUTs. Um, obviously, it's not just like film anything, drop a LUT on it, and we're good to go. Um, well, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny you say that because 
for me, that is kind of where I've streamlined my editing process too. I literally film in log and then I've made a preset. Uh, I don't know if you edit in Final Cut, but you can, if, if you add a load of effects onto something, you can actually save that as like your default effect, uh, which has got all of my, my color wheels and stuff and the exposure all set. I literally just drag all my clips into my timeline, let go, select all, and then double click this effect. And I'm like, yeah, that looks pretty good. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I admittedly, I'm not the most technical person. Like I went spent ages and ages tweaking a clip up and down. Um, and I think with color, there's just, you know, the possibilities are endless, aren't they? And everything is such a subjective taste. Uh, for me, I kind of try and at weddings, I like to act a bit more hands-on like a photographer. And I guess I like to color like a photographer as well with video. Obviously we don't have as much flexibility to, we want to make sure it looks technically right because overexposed stuff is, doesn't look technically good. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think just as long as you kind of expose everything properly and shoot in 10 bit, you give, you've got a bit more flexibility there. But yeah, I think I just really like the warmth. Um, I don't like bright greens. And that is pretty much my, I'd say my colors are like warm with desaturated greens. <laughs> so yeah, there, there isn't a lot, a lot to it. I don't use wave, are they waveforms or vector scopes or any of those things? I wouldn't even like, I thought one time I thought, right, I need to learn this. I opened up that, that viewing panel on my camera and I was like, no, no, <laughs> I don't need to look at this. Like for me, I just expose and edit everything by eye. So like, if it looks good with my eyes on my monitor and it looks good with on my computer screen when I'm editing it, then yeah. It looks, yeah. It looks and, okay. and that's, that's kind of what I was, you know, I, you have to shoot it correctly if you want to be able to just drag and drop obviously yes. a lot on there it can't just be like completely blown uh, out and it just or you're yeah. you know and i don't think you're shooting uh raw you're not shooting raw no uh, yeah. no no i mean um, uh i would have done but dji removed that feature with a firmware uh, update after a fallout with someone so oh, yeah i'm not I, and also I, I do think raw for raw for weddings is a bit overkill right and so yeah. like i think a lot of people though um, you know, they're, they're not under, like, they're not shooting in a high enough bit depth. They're not thinking through how to expose properly on the wedding day yeah. um, and things like yeah. that. And so I guess my question I was trying to get to there was just more, um, what you're doing on the day to make sure that you're getting things right in camera so that you'll have yeah. way less of a workflow when it comes to yeah. the edit. Well, well, I guess that is why my post-production is so easy because I know that I've kind of shot things to a certain point, a certain way that I can just drop that on there. Mm -hmm. um, so I always use ND filters. Sorry, Hunter. But yeah, I love using ND filters. The, the Ronin 4D has them built in, but when I'm using the Lumix cameras, I have like a, I use Canon fit lenses um, and the, 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 the lens mount has got like a built-in variable ND. So I'm always tweaking that. Um, using a like a shinobi or a ninja to preload your LUTs onto that with an SD card is really handy for like setting white balance because I generally tend to edit a bit warmer. So being able to tweak my white balance and seeing what the final outcome is going to look like most most of the way is really handy for just making sure it's shot correctly. Um, with log for years I was like watching YouTube videos and people would be like, yeah you gotta shoot vlog, you gotta shoot this and that excuse me, and I thought, oh, it sounds a bit a bit grown up for me. But once I tried it and used the gamma conversion LUTs, I thought, I wish I'd done this sooner because the, the amount of dynamic range and even if I'm shooting confetti outside and then the sun comes out and you think, ah, that's so blown out. With shooting in log, generally you can pull down those highlights and get some of that, that detail back. So yeah, definitely if you're not shooting in log and your camera offers it, give it a go, just like try it out at home, look up the right conversion LUTs because I was using some of the, the kind of manufacturer conversion LUTs and it wasn't really looking right. Like the skins were looking a bit pink or, you know, it wasn't quite right. But um, when Gamut released the the LUTs for, the conversion LUTs to turn Vlog into Rec 709 and then putting my LUTs, my LUTs on after that, I was thinking, ah, this looks different to what I'm used to shooting but it looks better. 
And so, yeah, I've only been shooting in log for like a year and a bit. But yeah, I think that has really helped streamline my process. So part of that process in post is applying a conversion LUT, then one of my LUTs like Hestia O2, which is like my favorite one. And then just bringing those highlights down and it's kind of done. Yeah, and that's a thing that I've really, you know, for people out there that are like, what the heck are these guys talking about? Um, you know, shooting in log is just capturing way more data when, when you're recording. Um, and like yeah. uh, Russell was saying, like I have my small HD monitor and I have the, con like there's a conversion LUT that will show you, it converts it to a, a what is called the rec 709 like space so you can see what yeah. it's going to look like if it's color graded and so you can install that onto a, a monitor and shoot yeah. in log but see what it's going to look like once it's been converted and so yeah. when i was out in denver in april I was hanging out with kaylin uh from white and reverie and uh you know he was like here put this this uh sd card into your monitor and like load the lut and i was just like Oh my gosh, this is so much better. Like just being able to see it as I'm shooting. And so I just got back from Guatemala. Yeah. I just got back from Telluride, Colorado for a mountain wedding. And like literally was able to like drag and drop the footage and then apply the LUT, bring down some highlights and like bump the saturation just a tiny bit and boom, I'm ready to go. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, that, that kind of, that's nice to hear that that's what you do as well, because I think people think it's just so scary yeah. they're not willing to take those chances and that's something that i kind of want to end yeah. um, this with is like taking chances and doing things practicing because this is art i've watched you um for some time now just like you're continually i can see you're trying new things you're trying new videos you're trying new transitions you're just continually evolving as an uh, artist and a human what would you say to somebody out there that's like on the verge of doing trying new things how would you how would you give them a mm -hmm. kick in the pants just try and see what sticks because yeah the the thing with this industry and video photo there is no right or wrong answer so just because other people are doing things a certain way doesn't mean that you have to do things that way as well so don't be afraid to go out of your comfort zone try new things show the world who you really are don't be afraid to to make fun of yourself, get creative, collaborate with people and just, yeah, just there are no right and wrong answers. Um, and as long as you create things that speak to you, then you can be pretty much certain that your clients are going to gonna love that as well. Oh, I love that. I love it all. I love having the chance to have gotten to, to meet you and hang out with you. I hope one day in real life Thank we'll get to so hang much. out. Your work yes. is so good. You're doing so many good things. I know our audience is going to love seeing what you do. Um, if people want to connect you. with you, uh, what's the best way for yeah. them to, to get in touch with you or find and well, follow along? Yeah, YouTube's been a bit slack lately. I'll be honest, I haven't had time for the kind of reviews and stuff. But the best way to reach out and see what I'm up to would be on my Instagram, which is at Russell Kent Nichols. Uh, that's two L's in Russell and Nichols as well. Um, yeah, just keep an eye on my stories for the day-to-day, -day. some very mundane, but some quite exciting um, behind the scenes of what I'm up to. Um, but yeah, any, I'm always happy to answer people's questions on gear, color grading, editing, anything really just, yeah, Instagram messages that is where it's at. So if you have any questions or anything, feel free to drop me a DM. And we'll throw those that link in the show notes, obviously, to your website as well as to uh, you. your LUTs on Gamut, the Hestia LUTs, and like, uh, yeah, because those are out now, and I've been seeing a lot of people using those, so those are super cool. Yeah, uh, thank you so thank much you. for taking the time to be on. Seriously, appreciate no, it. Thank you so much for having me. I feel I feel honored. Uh, well, thank you. The pleasure is all mine. I tell you that much. So, <laughs> all right, man. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you so much, Russell, for taking the time to be on our show today. I was inspired by our conversation. I love looking through your Instagram feed and seeing all the great things you're doing. And I am loving those LUTs that you can get at gamut.io. Just head over there. We'll put it in the show notes, of course, for you to check out the LUTs that Russell has available. I just wanted to also say, if you're still tuned in right now, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for taking the time to invest into you. You're putting in 
reps in your business, you're growing in your business, you're growing in your creativity, and you're doing things that other wedding filmmakers are not doing. If you know somebody that needs to be listening to this podcast, do us a huge favor, share this with them. Be sure to check out everything that we're doing over at howtofilmweddings.com. And until next time, we will see ya. Are you looking for a better way to deliver your wedding films to your couples? Look no further. Our friends over at Wedflow provide the most flexible video delivery solution on the market. Wedflow is paper project with no large upfront cost or commitment, and you can cancel any time. Not only that, Wedflow offers a premium viewing experience for your couples. Accessible on mobile, tablet, desktop, as well as their very own suite of TV apps. Each project comes with 10 years hosting and an experience for your clients that will blow them away. Stop delivering your films the old fashioned way and give your couples something to rave about. Head on over to howtofilmweddings.com slash Wedflow to check out Wedflow today.